Hi everyone. Uh, welcome back to our Let's Play. Just me this time. I uh, certainly enjoyed having my brother around, but uh, he lives a couple states away, so he had to go back. We might have him uh, come back sometime when the next time he's in the area, since that seemed to go pretty well. And now we are in the Great Mine Dungeon. The uh, well, I was talking to Mark about if he wanted to appear and and discuss this dungeon with me, but he said he would prefer, if he was going to do it, he was going to prefer um, one of his later ones. Uh, most players agree that Arc 3 and Arc 4 are basically the his best work. The dungeons and those are so good. Um, I think this one was a pretty big turning point, though. He said that this was the first dungeon that he, um, what do you call it? that he drew out all the rooms. Like, you know, he took a pencil, he drew in the map, and uh, just uh, laid it out beforehand. I'm out of here. <laughs> I always like doing that. Um, but uh, uh, he doesn't look at this as his, as his best. I think just, I think he, from our discussion, it sounded like... He felt like the um, the size gets a little out of hand. You know, the scale's not always, um, you know, under control. But I think it's a lot of fun, and uh, most of this is going to be devoted to it, if not all of it. All right, let's teach these guys a lesson. So this is a fun thing you can do right away. You just get in the minecart. Wee. Boo. Uh. You can knock those guys out to save, save yourself a fight. And we're going to get the numbers on the on the necks. This is one of the puzzles that I suspect he would do over. <laughs> um, we'll talk a little more, a little more about that later. Uh, incidentally, these are also some of the first battlers that Anchor ever did. Uh, because he joined the team when we were working on this dungeon. So the fir I think the first one I ever saw was one of the mole guys, but uh, this came shortly after. And even then, you know, we were trying to come up with creative ways to use what he gave us as not to burden him too much. Like you can see, uh, you know, the big guy will sometimes split into two little guys, which means you have a, you know, you can create a whole new monster just by shrinking the, uh, you know, another one. So I think that was pretty clever of Mark to, to do. Um, <laughs> sorry if, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of praise in my buddy in this one, so if that bugs you, you may want to watch another video. Um, now there are a lot of the parts of this dungeon that just didn't even make it into the, um, into the final game. Like he would make whole rooms and puzzles and then just scrap them because he didn't think they were, you know, they worked for whatever reason. I wonder if I can... No, I guess you can't do that. I was trying to see if I could use a cart to crash into that pile there, but I guess that's later on. Um, I think we changed tile sets a few times in this one, too. Okay, now we're outside, and I like this room a lot because... You know how in a lot of indoor areas you've got, like, the border? You know what I mean? Like the little... Anybody who's done RPG making knows what I'm talking about. We just had them in the last room. But in this case, there's none. So it just it does a good job of conveying um, the scale we're talking about. Just the scale of this place, because I mean it's so big. It's got like <laughs> it's got like little clouds or something. Whatever is full, probably that's probably smoke. But uh, it just shows like the size of this place. You know, it's not just this little cave where you're scrunching up and ducking under doors. This place is freaking huge. And now the little kids are getting called away. And Stoic is this close to just jumping down there. Truth be told, he probably would have made it. He would have been injured, but... You know, he was that angry about the whole thing. But Shroud is sort of showing an unusual amount of restraint here. Just keeping his, his uh, feelings under control. Which isn't always typical for him, but uh, it's not quite personal to him yet because even though he doesn't suspect Equipment King yet, 
And um, I get I get a people give me a hard time for you know when it is deduced the scene where he does deduce that equipment cake might have had something to do with this um, because it seems just too I guess contrived, too convenient to the story, too paranoid. I don't know. But uh, and we'll talk about that a little more next time when we get to that scene because I don't think we're gonna get to, get to it this time. But oh, uh oh. But basically. At this point, he does not suspect anything. Well, I mean, he suspects that, you know, kids are kidnapped because it's right in front of him. But, uh... So, it's... My point being is that it's not personal. So he's not, like, all fired up, really. I mean, he is a little bit, but not, like... You know, you see him later when it is personal, and he's just... Completely unreasonable at times. And here we have one of my favorite rooms in the dungeon, which is a, just a series of... of intersections of the mine track and you can change the levers and the gates will either repel the mine cart or change its direction or send it backwards I already said that didn't I or let it through now you want to know why that cart is like yellowish when shroud rides in it I'll tell you the original shroud sprite was an edited version of uh, an Arshus sprite. Arshus is like the main default character for, um, for RPG Maker XP. And so, you know, we threw that mask on him and, you know, changed it. And we changed his hair color by using the color slider that RPG Maker XP had. Why we bothered with that, I don't know, because that color slider was kind of crappy. Like, you get like neon people if you, <laughs> if you slid it very far in one direction or another. But we were able to use it to get um, Shroud a slightly uh, blonder haircut than Arsh's. And so when we made the minecart, we just kind of put him in the minecart and then used a color slider on that too. But um, in later versions of the game, Shroud's hair became a little less blonde, more of like an orange yellowish color, which I think, you know, probably looks a bit better. Um, and so he, and so, but that mine thing we never went around to, you know, change the color of that mine cart. Um, so there you go. That's a little, one weird little buggy thing explained. I like opening all the treasure, tre I like hitting all the treasures. It's fun. So we may be in here for a while. Now, originally, this room had encounters in it, which, you know, you heard me uh, get into this topic if you watch my Clean Slate Let's Play. Um, you should not be doing, uh, encounters in a room that's, that's really heavy on puzzles. Like, you're walking, you know, just imagine, you're walking around here, trying to see, like, how the paths work, plotting out your route in your head, and all of a sudden you gotta fight some guys. It's just a pain. And because it takes a while to get all this stuff, you know, you're just fighting constantly. And it's good for grinding, I guess, but other than that, it's it's a pain. So we um, wisely, I think, eventually got rid of that stuff, and now you can just fart around in this room for as long as you want. Let's see if I, if I did this right. Yeah, I think so. Yay! So, I want to tell you guys something. I think you might like it. I um, I picked up Legacy for the first time in, God, probably like two years at least, earlier this week, um, just to kind of look over what I'd made already and um, keep working on that early stuff, because that's a game where if it's going to work, the early stuff has got to be just nailed down like just right, because there's a lot to, to introduce and execute, um, not story-wise either, like generally gameplay wise so who knows maybe there'll be another maybe there'll be a demo of a Solus game you know in a few months time um, it means that this let's play is doing part of what I wanted it to do which is to sort of get me immersed in the in this world again and kind of hopefully inspire me in addition to entertain you guys of course but uh, from a personal point of view that was part of what I hope to get out of it um, so that seems to be working. 
And, uh, and in fact, what I could do, and you guys should let me know if this is something you're interested in, is maybe just like record myself uh, working a little bit on it or testing some stuff out, and then I could sort of explain stuff I want to do. And obviously, like with the, you know with Camtasia being able to see everything I'm working on, it would be you know much clearer, I think, than just me talking about it in one of these episodes. So if that's something that you're interested in, just uh, let me know. Although, I, uh, for anybody who's been watching this in RPG Maker Network, that's not something I would be able to put on there because Legacy doesn't have a page there. and I don't think I'd feel comfortable making one until I had a demo to show off. I mean, some people don't care. Some people make a big, fancy-ass game page and they've got nothing. They could barely have any like uh, dialogue written. But uh, that's, that's not my style. It never has been. Oh, look at this. An elevator. See, I tell you, man, this place is huge. I wonder if um, any of the really hardcore fans can tell the difference between when me when I map something and when, when Mark does. I think Mark tends to go for... has a better sense of scale and stuff than I do. Um, oh, yeah, these fuckers again. <laughs> Sorry. It's a catchy song though, isn't it? It's from like Grandy or something. And it's a good song in the sense that like it can play over and over and over again and you won't get too sick of it. At least I hope not. Unless you're <laughs> unless you're a certain reviewer and uh, you think this is the battle music and you don't like it. That's a little in-joke for some people. Um... Alright, so there was also a rather severe bug in this room when we first put this out. Like, you've got this, this friggin' guy here who, um, you know, turns off the bridge. But I guess if, you know, and then you have to uh, solve the puzzle to ride the, uh, the, the minecart over the bridge and get, the, get him. There was an issue, though, if you didn't do everything in the right order in this room... It would freeze. Okay, well, I'll, I'll talk about that one in a minute. For now, we gotta talk about this number puzzle because this has stumped ev like basically everyone. And now you're watching me give me the answers. Three, one, four, two. Okay, that's so. Write that down if you haven't played it, because <laughs> so you, you won't have to come to the forum or well, we don't have a forum anymore. You don't have to come to the site or Facebook looking for help. Um. It's based on the form is next, because the Stoic knows all, and he figured it out. So the reason he said the last one was 34 was because the third letter in the sequence was 4. You see what I'm saying? So you had 13, which meant that the first letter was a 3. You had, um, what was it, 21, I think. So the second one was 1, and then he had 42. It's really, actually, really simple when you think about it, but the problem was, for whatever reason, like, I don't know, getting the player's mind to, um, to go there, to, like, think about the numbers in that way, was hard for whatever reason. Like, it just didn't come naturally. Now, speaking of puzzles that stump people, there's two switches in here that you need to pull that are sitting right behind these little minecarts. And they turn off a security system at the bottom of this room. A lot of people got stumped by that too, but they're both right there, right in front of you. A uh, little tricky. Um, but back to the previous room that would crash. The whole game would freeze. It was a bad crash. So, and this, this arc happened to come out when Mark was on a family trip to Italy. So he was absolutely like not able to fix it so I just uh, <laughs> I was just on the forums like posting as much as I could like okay you gotta do it when you get to this room you gotta do it exactly this way because it's gonna crash otherwise and we can't fix it yet but then of course he got back and all was well now I'm going to this part early this is actually the end of the dungeon um, Lolo. 
um, the end of the dungeon here. And uh, but there's a fairy that you that will heal you and you can save and all that. So I like to sort of unlock this place early. But a lot of times people don't get to this room until the end because the the switch puzzle with the minecarts stumps them. But this is what's cool about a lot of uh, Mark's dungeons is that like there's a certain non-linear quality to them. I mean, not completely, but. You can do things, you know, in, in different orders a lot of the time. Like the room that I was in with the dragon statues. There's four there's four paths that branch off. And before you're able to sort of get to the boss fight, um, you're going to have to do all of them. But you can do them pretty much whenever. So, for instance, I'm going to go this way. And we'll see what we can find. Out of the monsters, obviously. Yeah, I got a feeling I'm not going to finish this one in time. In the past, I've been. F oh! Let's fight these fellas. Um, in the past, I've been getting through all like the dungeons in one entry, more or less, but. This one's just too goddamn big. <laughs> no, it'll probably be the case with the other ones too. They they get larger, you know, when you start getting farther into the game. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm being a little quiet. I just I don't know. I guess I'm a little uh out of practice and I gotta come up with some things to talk about while we just sort of fight our way through these guys. Um, so I mentioned last time that the whole idea of kidnapping kids was, this is kind of like a metaphor for, you know, uh, bad labor practices. I mean, obviously, you know, child labor was a thing back in like I don't know, the 20s or whatever, until we made it illegal. And keep that in mind, by the way, that like that used to be legal, and there are plenty of interests in this country that would have liked to keep it that way. So I'm just going to point that out. Oh, you know what this is? This is the... You have to actually like forge and make the key to that church in here. But I don't have the key plans. So I could continue on and, you know, get the smithy already and stuff, but... Without the plans, there's, you know, I'll be backtracking anyway, so I might as well go do that part now. Um, anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, child labor. It's no good. Don't do it. <laughs> um, but basically, like, I remember when it came out in the 90s that this was kind of a practice. It was shortly after some of the big trade deals were packed, like, you know, NAFTA and, and CAFTA and shit like that. What was it called, CAFTA? I don't know, something like that. Just those free trade agreements. And um, in some ways, those things help. You know, I'm not like 100% uh, anti-trade agreements and shit like that. I mean, that's I'm fairly moderate about it. I mean, there are definitely ways that they help. If you think about all the call centers in India, you know, how like you call for like, you know, technical support on your cable. <laughs> all of a sudden you talk to somebody in India. I and mean, people make fun of it, but... It's, it's, you know, it's created a lot of employment over there. And even though they're not the best jobs in the world. Um, but the problem is, I mean, it can get taken to extremes. And you've got, like, the poor people making, working their asses off in these factories for, like, n hardly any money. And I remember it came out in the 90s that Nike, you know, the shoes, they were getting their parts, you know, from these Vietnamese factories that were mostly female employees that, you know, were getting, like, sexually harassed by their bosses, and they made hardly any money, and it was kind of a scandal. I remember talking about it in middle school. <laughs> you know, and the current events didn't always make it into middle school. Um, and it's nice to have some memories of middle school that aren't just around feeling humiliated, so I should thank Nike for that. Um, but just the idea that, like, you know, we can complain about working conditions in America, and we should, because there's a lot that we can do better, but 
there's definitely countries that are worse and you know you got these some of these countries that just don't have any protections for for people and we're buying and we're buying stuff from them you know because it's cheaper like all our iPhones and stuff they're made by random people in China who are getting paid like fuck all and but it's cheaper for Apple so they do it and I mean that's that dilemma isn't it it's like the, the whole people versus profit thing um, because you know a business is out to make it's out to make money but if you want to do things ethically you're you're giving up you're giving up potential money so that's why people are um, you know reluctant to to do that I mean you know it's it, most of the time it's not because they're just dicks and they want to see people suffer or whatever um, that might be the case with Monsanto but with most companies I'd say that's probably not uh, so you know it, it's just they feel like they need more money you know I mean that's an attitude that I have a hard time understanding especially with like a giant ass country a company like Apple I mean god <laughs> you know if they don't have enough money then nobody does but uh I don't know, it's rough. And in America, it's a little, you know, we have a unique situation in that employees, I mean, not employees, employers are supposed to be giving health care to, um, to their employees. I was just talking about this on Facebook with somebody who is more conservative than me, but uh, we sort of both agree that this is a shitty arrangement because it's not helping the employees or the employers. Because, you know, in like a lot of the European countries, it's just the government's in charge of it. And I think, and I think that's the better way to do it, because um, you know, because you, healthcare is like a it's a moral issue, right? It's a moral responsibility. It's it's not really supposed to be a business, because the business is about making money. So pairing it with businesses just seems like a shitty idea. You know what I mean? Like, why would you do that? You know, you're making companies spend all this money to, to pay for health care plans for the employees that, you know, they don't even want to. And, you know, and so because of that, they feel even less comfortable, like, you know, pursuing other ethical decisions. You know what I mean? So it's, I don't know, I think we need a little socialism. That's, that's, you know, I'm, I guess you call me a, a Bernie bro, although I don't really have any other bro tendencies, so... And, uh, I don't know, talking shit about women on Twitter is not my thing. <laughs> wow, Rob, how many different people can you offend with, like, three or four minutes of, of, of chatter? So this is what happens when I'm by myself, and I'm just dungeon crawling. <laughs> um, so let's let's talk about something more practical. Let's talk about the mole maze here. Um, there's a map somewhere. But, of course, when this first came out, there were no maps. So it was pretty common to get lost in here. Um, it's it, you still can like I only have a um, I only have a vague idea of where everything is uh, but I know there's a map but I haven't found it by the time I find it I'll probably be at the end of the puzzle but you know it's all good level up fighting the moles you know what I'm saying so yeah that hammer mole that mole with the pickaxe was the first battle I ever saw from uh, from anchor and I was fairly impressed and then he got the Shroud and Stoic Battlers done, and I was like, holy old blue Jesus. You know, I mean, these, those are, those are fantastic. I mean, you got all the details in Shroud's armor there, and his, like, position holding his spear is really cool, just behind his back. And then you got Stoic, who's pretty tough looking. Got the scimitars. It's good stuff, man. He did a lot of, um, even though he didn't finish all the battlers the first time around, he did a lot the first for the first release of this arc. He did all the moles, including the um, the mole with the, the, the pickaxe, the mole with the sledgehammer, and the big mole, the mole boss, we'll see in a little bit, hopefully. <laughs> um, he did those lizards, he did the rock guys, he did the foreman, the original foreman battler, he did deacon, uh, he did... Um, Urcello, the musician, and all of the four angels. Oh, wait, no, he didn't. 
No, the first time around we didn't have the angels. That was later. My mistake. But he did Arcello. And then he did uh, Sparrow. Yeah, Gabrielle didn't have a uh, battler right away either, though. There was one later. We actually had a few for her in the end. Um, but, you know, it'll be time to talk about that later. Oof. This is where that Undertale stuff starts to come back in. Because <laughs> how many moles am I just wiping out here? I like to think that they're just running away, but... There's really nothing to indicate that, is there? Okay, so we got to the end. Let's see. What are we doing on time? All right, you know what? Let's just tack the uh, let's tack the mole boss on the end of this. What do you say? We'll make this a nice, full, complete episode with a climactic ending. Um, anyway, let me know. I know I've already asked you to weigh in on some stuff already, but um, if you think I'm getting too out of control with like talking about politics, just let me know because. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of politics in this game, but uh, that last little rant of mine was not even, like, only vaguely connected to what we were doing, so if that stuff bugs you. But I figure if you didn't want my opinion on things, you wouldn't be listening to this, so there's that. <laughs> Here we go. I think um, when Mark first came up with that intro, with the mole surrounding you in carts, I think he wanted to have some kind of uh, like a vent in the battle where like a cart would come and hit both of them but we just couldn't really pull it off so I guess for now we should just assume that they're just uh, just jumping out of the carts to assist in the fight as needed um, oof this guy's hit hard it's kind of funny that we randomly have like this mini dungeon right in the middle of, of the bigger dungeon it was, we were just so like I don't know we were so uninhibited about like this stuff we were just going all out in terms of the the dungeon experience and I think later in the game probably around 5 arc 5 they start to get more streamlined more focused on like you know one thing and you know people can sort of debate them amongst themselves uh oh. <laughs> we did do the throwing thing though. I always like that, it's funny. Um, so you can debate whether it's better to have a dungeon centered around like one consistent mechanic or if it's better to have like a sort of wide selection of puzzles. I mean depending on the day I can I can go for either. Uh, so that's, you know, so it makes it interesting to talk about. Um, and that's probably why, um, I was, oops, oh dear. Um, I was talking to Mark earlier and about dungeons in this game and just like, which one was my favorite? And I think my favorite is Solix Lab, which is in Arc 4, so I won't be getting to that for a while, but, because it's, it almost, it, it basically mixes the two things that, I've just been talking about, which is that you have a golem. You're sort of con you're controlling a golem, which is the meat of that dungeon. But there's so many different things for it to do that you also have that sense of variety. So I think achieving both of those things is, is what made that my favorite dungeon. But hey, we're having a good time here, right? This mole's got to be going now pretty soon, and then we'll uh, bring this to an end for today. Um. So yeah, so I so I think Mark may contribute around arc 3 or 4 if he's feeling up to it um, I know he's not always as comfortable just like babbling like I am into a mic um, funny thing is I'm kind of shy in person too depending on who I'm talking to but I don't have any trouble doing this I find this pretty enjoyable uh, and you know maybe my brother will be back and I don't know if there's anybody else I could get as a guest um yeah, I don't know. I guess if Anchor was ever interested. But I'm not sure he'd want to either. Alright, we win. That's right, he's beaten. Funny thing about the moles in this game is that they don't they communicate only with like gestures and squeaks. Which I think is probably why the uh the rest of Solus doesn't really consider them a, a formal race in the way that um you know, humans or elves or whatever they are. Ooh, treasure. We gotta get the treasure. 
So I think that's something I want to hit in Legacy a little bit. Just like that question of, you know, like what makes something, what makes a creature like a person, you know what I mean? Like what, like how much sentience, I guess, do you need before like, you know, you can be considered on equal footing with, uh, you know, the more intelligent creatures of the, of the world. I think that's kind of interesting thought. Oh, come on, you guys, go away. Alright, so next time... What are we doing next time? I guess we have to get that key, don't we? Yeah, so let's just walk over to that safe out and I was back here, and then uh, we'll call it a day. So I hope you guys are enjoying this. Uh, sorry that this wasn't necessarily the most coherent uh, talk I've given, but, uh, you know... Practice makes perfect. Alright, see you guys next time. Peace.